Welcome to the first episode of my new series, Weird Australia. Now, there's a lot of weird sh** in Australia, and I'm not talking about what's on offer in the gift shops at Darling Harbour. Not many people know that Australia is actually a hotbed for UFO activity, and there are several hotspots around this beautiful country of ours. Starting with Alice Springs at the Red Centre. This is where a lot of outback sightings occur, and somewhere outside of the main town is Pine Gap. Some people consider it Australia's Area 51. I've also heard that there's a Stargate at the top of Uluru, now, I've actually been to Uluru, I think I was 14. I can't vouch for the Stargate claims. The Blue Mountains is just outside of Sydney and it's another hot spot. For those who don't know, these rocks are known as the Three Sisters. And the story goes that they were changed to stones by their father to save them from the Bunyip, which is a cryptid with a bone chilling cry from, from Aboriginal folklore. And then there's Melbourne. Anyone living in Melbourne, don't tell me this isn't an accurate depiction. Yo -yo! And lastly, there's Tasmania, most of which is covered in dense ancient rainforest. There have been a number of just weird disappearances and sightings there, including a young man who was flying his plane. My mum and I were there about nine years ago before they closed down the Cadbury factory. Anyway, today's episode takes us to the country's progressive paradise, Melbourne. This is the real Melbourne for anyone watching for overseas. You're welcome for the free tourism guide, by the way, Australian government. This is where the country's biggest and most famous UFO sighting took place. A documentary was made about the event and the story has been in the news intermittently ever since. But still, not that many people actually know about it. Do you believe in UFOs or unidentified flying objects? Well, many Australians do. Might have heard about Roswell, the great conspiracy theory about UFOs crashing in the deserts of New Mexico. Well, Australia has its own UFO mystery as well. Something very strange in suburban Melbourne. Witnessed by 200 people who say it was kept secret by the military. 50 years ago. of April 1966 started just like any other day in the city of Melbourne. Then something very strange appeared in the sky above the suburb of Westall. It hasn't been explained to this day. This is a mystery story that has as its setting a school and most of the players were school children. They had this extraordinary experience, which they then tried to share with adults. And a lot of them had a lot of trouble doing that. They were disbelieved, almost stigmatised. I think like a lot of other people, I just shut up about it because of the ridicule. And it was everybody. You know, you were a kid, you were making it up. So you just be quiet and in your mind, you just think, I know what I saw and no one's ever gonna shake me from that. I know what I saw. I was precipitating various chemicals in order to make crystals and I just had to be looking out the window thinking how to fudge my science report. What I saw directly south was something that I'd never seen before. We were out playing sport on the oval. One of the kids yelled out, look, look up in the sky, you know, it's flying saucers. And, and I remember we all looked up and it really was a flying saucer. <laughs> I mean, from what you imagine, a flying saucer, it was a round silver disc um, 
and it, it seemed to be very low over the school and I remember kids screaming and running inside. This student came in, uh, was hysterical, leaned up against a sliding door, screaming there's a flying saucer in the oval. And of course everybody started to head towards the door and the teacher said, sit down, it's not recess yet. And a few minutes later the bell went off. Everyone started moving like a whole lot of zebras being terrified by crocodiles. I went where the herd went. <laughs> Barbara Robbins was the chemistry teacher at the time. And she just grabbed a camera and started clicking. and it disappeared down behind the trees. So we all got through this fence and ran towards where it had appeared to land. Tanya and I, and this other girl, we were over the fence. Tanya was in the lead Tanya. and we ran towards where it was coming down. Tanya. I lost sight of Tanya, she was in front of me. A couple of girls got there faster than me, I'm, I was a bit slow, and they actually passed out and apparently it did land because when we got there, there was a great big round patch of like flattened yellow, almost burnt, although I'm a bit sketchy on that. I can't remember if it was really burnt or whether it was just flattened, but it was sort of yellow and the grass was all flattened in a swirly sort of a pattern. Mm -hmm. It's a high fence and I got up, got up to the top there and all you could see is two discs, one there and one bit further away, probably three metres apart. I could hear somebody in the background saying, stay away, don't jump the fence. And so I said, oh bugger, I'm going over the fence. The craft probably would have been about there. And there was another one set back a bit on an angle, oh, probably just about there. There's a few kids walking around there. And I was the only one on this side. I got up to it to want to touch it and it was, well, you could feel heat about a metre away coming from. It was pretty warm or hot. And within a few minute or so, it just, both of them just lifted up at the same time, about this height. And um, I seen what, oh, that was breathtaking watching that. And then it just gradually lifted, lifted up, and then went off towards the pines. Before I got there, um, the disc came back up again. So I stopped chasing it. We looked up and we just saw this saucer type thing taking off and it seemed to turn side on and just disappear into thin air. Well, what about your friend Tanya? I believe she did see it on the ground. She did see it on the ground? So I was given to believe, yes. yes. Um, but I went back to school and Tanya went back to school and basically had gone all to pieces. There was definitely an ambulance on the oval and I was told that she'd been taken away in the ambulance and that was the last time I ever saw her. Wow. She was just gone and she never came back to school. We were loading up for market and as we were pulling the carrots up, I looked up and I was facing the object in the sky and um, I just thought, oh, somebody's got some way of uh, projecting a film of something into the sky. I didn't believe that it was really happening. But um, my boss turned around and he saw it and we stood there looking at it for several minutes. A few moments later, the children came over from the high school and they noticed us, they saw us, and they sort of took a while to make up their mind whether they would come onto the property, realising it's private property. Yes. And they... Um, decided they'd come in anyway and they did. They ran straight over, straight over the market garden and they crossed and walked down here to this corner. After a while, um, trucks turned up with, um, it looked like army trucks. Right. And um, there would have been about 20 guys got out. About how long after um, the object had vanished in the trees? Oh, I think it was only 20 minutes, which is not a long time. How did you know they were from the army? Um, well, they were khaki coloured trucks, the um, covered in patches, you know, sort of 
that they uh, to hide, you know. Like camouflage? Camouflage truck, yeah. And it was uh, the long ones that carry quite a few people and a couple of Jeeps. So a couple of yeah. trucks yeah, and a couple Jeeps. of Jeeps yeah. and about 20 men yeah. In, yeah. in uniforms? Yeah, yeah. And the uniforms were what sort of uniforms? Uh, just khaki coloured uniform. Just khaki? Yeah. No other, I don't remember any other sort Not of... Not that I can remember. Colours no. or... No. I did a rough sketch of it. Wow, look at that. This is the view from underneath. That's like. underneath. There's no seams, no joints, mm. it's just smooth metal. Normally an aircraft has uh, sheet metal, pop rivets, or all that sort of stuff there. This looked like it come out of a mould or something like that, all one yes. smooth piece of metal. Uh, it was just incredible. It's just something like you see in the movies. That was some compelling testimony, and I think we've got a pretty clear idea of what was seen and what the witnesses believe. But the story does get weirder. Just two days before Westall, Ron Sullivan was driving in central Victoria when he noticed a strange light display in front of him. Got up towards it, and holy moly, the whole thing lit up in the 10 foot area at the bottom, sort of come up and met the top, and the headlights of the car. It was the biggest awesome thing I've ever seen. I just pulled to the right of this old magnetised. I could see all the trees on the right hand side of the road lighting up and I said, get out of this one. I pulled on the left. Now I could feel the back left wheel spinning and I got out of that. Ron only reported the incident after he heard that a young man died when his car collided with the same tree Ron had narrowly missed two days earlier. A couple of people from the government departments come and visit me. I know one was from the Air Force. They looked at the car, just walked around. I said, well, let's know what you find out. And they said, yeah, we will. We will, Mr Sullivan. Never heard any more about it. So what the hell is going on in Melbourne? Well... There are a number of possibilities. It's possible what was seen was a nylon target drogue, a windsock-like object used for target practice, although this seems to be the least likely explanation as it doesn't fit the witness descriptions at all and there is no information on this on the internet. Another explanation is a weather balloon. The idea that what those people saw came from outer space is alien to Richard Saunders from Australian Skeptics. On that very morning, not too far away, about 30 kilometres away, a weather balloon was released. The winds were blowing towards the school. Now, I've seen a weather balloon in the sky near uh, an airport and stuff me, I didn't know what it was. It had to have been something that we were working on and we, we, we knew all about it. We were in on it, even though we might have known the detail to have responded. That's one of the, that really, to my, to my way of thinking, that's the key. It's the fact that we respond, whoever it was, the authorities responded so rapidly. Now, they must have just about been sitting on the trucks with the engine going. And perhaps they were. Perhaps they'd received technical intelligence that there was something going wrong with this experimental craft and they weren't sure where it was going to land, but they were ready to go get it as soon as it did land. We hid behind this tree, but fortunately this tree, the branches came down to the ground. Here we are, crouched down on our knees, and we can only look every so often as this tractor came around. He was on guard duty. This was a farmer who has decided to help out. We observed two army trucks, two men in the camouflage, and two men in blue uniforms. We better cover this uh, area. And it appeared that a uh, soldier was using a metal mine detector is walking around sweeping back and forth Keep down. the next time i see them they turned and they started kicking violently at the ground the two officers decide then time to come back they come back to the truck and they were gone and then we could enter the paddock we had no idea what we were walking into we didn't know what those army men were doing and I, all i can say it was just what is this have the army there and all the rest of it, it was something important. They certainly were not Australian, because Australians were not using camouflage uniforms in those days, in the, in the mid-60s. Uh, nor would they have been British. But the description of the uniforms certainly matches those worn by the United States Air Force um, in the mid-1960s. 
That afternoon, our principal called a, a special um, assembly and told us all not to talk about it. All I know is the whole school was told off. The headmaster says, all oh, you kids are nuts. It's a weather balloon. Uh, don't talk about it. I was prepped uh, to tell the students that what they'd seen didn't exist. We weren't allowed to leave the school, at least I wasn't. My job was to walk up and down the corridors and make sure that all students were in their rooms. I was walking back from the West End. There was a confrontation between Mr. Sambleby, Barbara Robbins, and a man I'd never seen before. I thought it was a police uniform, but it was just dark blue. It was demanded that she hand over, not the film, but the entire camera. I was near the gate and the police had arrived. There were journalists outside. The police were being caught in to keep the journalists away. We were told that we weren't allowed to speak to the media in school grounds. Everyone's response to this seems like a pretty big overreaction, in my opinion, if we're just talking about a balloon here. It's possible that this is actually a cover-up of illegal or corrupt activities rather than interdimensional ones, which in and of itself warrants an explanation. So, what else could it be? Um, initially, I would have said it was some sort of test aircraft. I fell in line with that theory. But there's never been an aircraft, to my knowledge, today that can do what that did. Is it? Do you think it's an alien craft? Do you think aliens were in there? Or are you sort of playing it safe here? Well, I'm trying to be rational, I'm trying to be logical, I'm trying to be fair to the evidence. I often like to refer to it as a flying source because that's what it was called at the time. It was called that because that's what it looked like. A saucer turned upside down on another saucer or bowl. That was the shape that it presented. It was an unidentified flying object. It was seemingly a solid, metallic looking object that flew, that nobody could identify. This obviously wasn't an aeroplane, it wasn't a helicopter, it wasn't a drone, it wasn't a kite, and I don't mean to prick anyone's balloon, but it wasn't, to me, quite obviously, a meteorological balloon or anything like that. Now, I think that's as much as we can say, but what is really interesting is the level of response to whatever this was, and I don't know what it was, but certainly the government authorities, the Royal Australian Air Force, the Army, the Civil Defence Organisation, all responded on this day. Why did they respond and why, in addition to that, is there no information about this incident publicly available in any of the government archives? They're some of the interesting questions. Yes, those are interesting questions, because we've still had no word on the subject and it's been several years since the release of that documentary. Maybe it really was aliens. We live in an electromagnetic spectrum that's 0.005% of what exists in the universe, so mainstream science says, and we can only see a tiny fraction of visible light of that electromagnetic spectrum of 0.005%. If you take the projected size of the universe according to mainstream science, then the Earth, by comparison, is one billionth of a pinhead. You, you run, run the numbers, numbers and you realize it would be inexcusably egocentric to suggest that we were alone in the universe. And so anyone who's actually studied the problem would say, sure, sure, the, 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 the statistics strongly argue in favor of life. Now, whether it's intelligent life that we would call intelligent, here's, here's, you want to lose sleep? Maybe there's life that's so intelligent, it doesn't consider us to be intelligent. Look, over the many years, our memories do change a little bit. But it is burned into my memory. Um, I know what I saw, and no matter what anyone says, I know that it was something very unusual. Now, I'm not telling you what to believe, and I don't know what the answer is. All I can say is, look at the information and make up your own mind. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to watch that full documentary, there's going to be a link in the description box. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next episode. Can I ask what happened to the girl? You um, 
You took her back to the school, the one that was hysterical. Is it Tanya? Mm -hmm. And um, she went into the hospital and then you went to visit her at her place and they said she didn't live there. That's yes, right. I, went to, I went to her house the following day and an English-speaking woman opened the door and said there had never been a Tanya living there. Now, the problem with that is that Tanya's parents didn't speak English to start with. I think they were Yugoslavian. So I'd been to this house a lot of times and then was told, no, sorry, you're mistaken.